presentations will be made by Peter Call and Daniel Nagley. Peter focusing on the problem of architecture between space and iconography, and uh, Daniel will talk on the image of the body in the work of uh, Le Corbusier. Uh, Daniel Nagley is uh, an architect and a critic. He, uh, grabbed, he studied at the AA at Yale and at the University of Pennsylvania, where he finished, uh, he wrote a dissertation on Le Corbusier's seeing things, ambiguity and illusion in the representation of modern architecture under the supervision of Joseph Rickworth and David Lederbauer, who is uh, who's here. He has published numerous articles on Le Corbusier and photography and presently teaches in the Department of Environmental Design at University of Missouri, uh, Columbia. Uh, Peter Call, uh, very difficult, <laughs> very difficult to introduce Peter. Um, my first teaching experience has been together with Peter, so uh, it goes back a long way. He uh, is an amazing uh, and dedicated uh, teacher, mind, intellect, uh, has done a lot of research on the work of, uh, uh, of Le Corbusier, has uh, published a lot of articles, and uh, is uh, currently completing a book on uh, Ronchamp. He also is one of our external examiners here. Please welcome Peter Carr. Still completing a book on Ronchamp. <coughs> um, could I have a, oh, I did, I have it. Um, uh, years ago, I was, I thought of myself as fairly alone in studying the problem of iconography in Le Corbusier, and this, the scene is now swarming with iconographers, and much, to my mind, irresponsible talk about cosmologies and earth goddesses, and as if we, A, knew what a cosmology was, and B, would know what to do with it if we had one. Um, and I worry that we're going to end up with a Le Corbusier that's suspended between the uh, sort of immediate post-war interpretations of him as form and space, which of course he talked about, him, he talked about himself that way very frequently. And on the other hand, our, um, iconography, that is to say as a kind of concept. This is attractive to the contemporary culture where you know, all icons are clickable. And as a way of trying to reorient thinking towards architecture, I thought I would try to open a speculation regarding what seems to me to be a kind of architectural setting in which it enabled him to communicate with all the uh, ephemera that were happening around him, these motifs of change and so on and so forth. Whether or not um, avant-gardism is itself a bourgeois problem, it seems that this issue of myth, as people like Iliada and so forth root it, is also a bourgeois problem and is sp speaks to a deeper problem of our lack of situatedness or situatedness in history. The, the building I'm going to use as a vehicle for this um, is the Tower of Shadows at, at Chandigarh. It was, of course, executed about 20 years after his death an, an interesting problem of transmission in its own right, from drawings that had reached a certain stage, usually drawings that had reached this stage in his work represented a kind of way we'd go into the site. Things usually change quite a bit um, after that. But at any rate, it's wonderfully crude in both its execution and in its conception. It has the quality of a preliminary diagram, potentially full of meaning, not yet architecture. Now this business of a meaningful or significant or important or profound building is, is a real problem. As we all know, jokes are easy, as is the play of forms in light or in Photoshop. That the, the problem of having an architectural intention or that has some credibility is not a private problem. It isn't just a question of your architectural imagination but of your cultural judgment. It depends on one's wit and tact, one's sense of what is, I don't know, true or what matters. There's a, both Ojam and Missonier confirm the anecdote that, <coughs> you know, the Corbusier's office had the, all, all the boards in a line. He would go from desk to desk, and when he ran into a problem that was difficult, he would just sit back and say, l'architecture c'est difficile. 
and go on to the next desk. And he would come in the following day, having worked in his atelier with what everybody called a hieroglyph, a little colored drawing. And at this point, the opinions of the office split into two. There were those who said, this is the reason to work in the office, because it completely transformed the building or whatever it was they were working with. And the other half said, oh shit, we've completely transformed the building. We're now going to start over and rework it. Having said that, having said that, you know, the, 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 the condensation isn't about efficiency or ease of building or something like that. It's actually trying to get the meaning right. But having said that, his poetics are also responsible for what everybody decries in his cities. And this is, this is not a simple problem, because if you are talking about something that is true or what matters, it matters collectively. It pertains to some sort of dimension of cultural universality, which for you know, most of Europe's history has resided in or through the city. Um, I may come back, I may be able to have a chance to come back to that at the end, but um, on, the, on the thesis that I won't, I'll just carry on. Right. The, um, Tower of Shadows um, is positioned, I don't have a pointer, but you can see where it is out in front of the, the, the parliament as part of this little world, what? There's one right there. Ah, let's see. Um, it's positioned right here and the, it's uh, oriented due north-south with the ramp of the martyrs and you could process through it to the, to the trench of consideration, or pit of consideration, as he called it. And it's part of this whole buildup about which I will um, say only a few words later. Um, oh dear, we seem, to be, we seem to be missing a crucial plan somewhere. Um, the, uh, the way this thing is configured, if you look at the way the thing is published in last works, you see that there's a west facade that's got a lot of brisole, an east facade that's got half as many, and a south facade that is just a few vertical planes. He speaks of it as being, for, you know, that it's supposed to produce shadow. In fact, it's the, the brisole are precisely aligned to deliver sun at the worst time of the day. So the sun absolutely roars through there, um, particularly um, uh, on the south. So the thing is either a portal from the trench of consideration, because there's no brisole on the north side, um, to this upper level, and in fact anybody who arrives by car only attains this upper level by going through the buildings, um, or it's a you know port de l'enfer or something down into the trench of consideration. Um, the section amusingly shows the light coming from inside the thing, so God knows what the people were actually doing. It's also published with this elaborate drawing showing they took great care with the sun angles. Um, I, I'll leave that up in the air for the moment. Now, as um, in plan, it is one square with a, another square rotated inside it, and anybody roughly familiar with Western architectural tradition would say, ah, what we're dealing with is something left over from the Middle Ages having to do with the diversification of the soul, or the differentiation of the soul from the divine to matter, um, set within something like the Tower of the Winds, it's open to the four quarters, and we're dealing with a kind of configuration that deals with the reconciliation between human and universal conditions. However, he doesn't call it a Tower of the Winds, he hardly has anything to say about souls, and <clears throat> even though you, you he, as far as I know, he hardly knew of this tradition. He did bits of it accidentally, but I'm not going to get into that. Um, but he seems to have something similar in mind, and that, that's intriguing, and it's this kind of receptacle of how this can happen that I'm, that I'm interested in following. Um, right, I'm going to do this in num by the numbers. One, shadows. Um, you all know this sun diagram, and it really is a diagram. It doesn't really represent the sun. It represents a cycle and a, a, tran a translation between light and dark. In the poem, he speaks of it as a brutal division. But what you also see on pages 14 and 15 of the poem is a very interesting uh, operation where if, if you imagine that light has two opposites, one is shadow, usually involved with moral or intellectual orientation or clarity, and the other with matter, which traditionally is involved with ontological structure. 
he's trying to combine them. Um, so you have himself as this kind of aqueous black and white stone. Um, take my word for it, that's what it looks like in the original. Um, positioned above this extreme dialectic between geometry, the logarithmic spiral, and the stone. And that's paired with the generation of shadow, the brutal division, as if the division is the, the, the division in half, and he speaks of this in these fairly violent terms, is the beginning of all gradation, the beginning of all temporality, i.e. the emergence of order in a much more general sense. And that's actually quite a sophisticated idea. I'm, I'm, it'd be lovely to develop it further, but I'm not going to. What you see in the poem is three temporalities. One is the cycles of nature. Two is this kind of dialectics of wandering and a fusion that has the quality of sexual union. And three is a kind of transformational rupture, the new times, that it, it attracts the, the blossoming, all of this intensity of metaphors and so forth. It's probably um, what is meant by l'espace indicible, which is used only once in the poem. L'espace indicible literally translates unsayable. Those of us who are not terribly <coughs> fond of space refer to it as unspeakable. But what you're really dealing with is uh, a species of, oh, sorry, when he uses it in the poem, it has to do with a mingling of forms and times. Um, interesting moment of both dispersive and constitutive combined. Um, and you're dealing with a much bigger problem, the sublime, as some sort of substitute for the transcendent or possibly for the sacred. I'd also suggest that this three-part temporality is what lies behind what's been called phenomenal transparency. But again, no. Um, actually, we're not quite here yet, but it doesn't matter. Um, the sun isn't a friendly play of Mediterranean light on forms. Um, or is he actually, that was, never mind. It is also a brutal struggle, as I've, as I've suggested. And he makes a great case out of the bris soleil as sun breakers, as some sort of battle with the sun. And so you're involved with something like um, an architecture of shadows. Um, and in this form, one form of this, it is a um, a rhythmic shadowing, i.e. a kind of preliminary condition of preliminary structure where you can't really say where the center of gravity is or where it isn't. It is a very preliminary kind of condition. He publishes a doshi image for the mill owners. He publishes a doshi with uh, Hervé to try to show them as vehicles of light and dark, but also incidentally showing that they are not really about shadow, but they're again oriented to the southwest. They're about, if you just see in the middle of the one on the left, it's about letting the sun come in and traverse that space as a cascade of rhythmic shadows. Um, now, in regard to shadows and architecture, the principal spaces of this period are, as is well known, um, dark caves or caves and tents that have the uh, Ronchon, La Tourette Chapel, the Parliament Building at Chandigarh, and of course, when he published saint Bon, he not only included Truin's little collage, or one of Truin's collages in the lower right where a rock sits on top of Rouen, but a, um, um, a page from the poem um, where he describes uh, libraries and museums as warehouses on the other side of night, this incredible sort of latent world of imagery of potential cultural material, the opposite, of course, of the upright active man of the poem. Um, now, the degree of aqueousness varied, or um, in other words, these caves um, were, were, were very uh, ambiguous, fluctuating, had a, the, 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 a, a fluctuating spatiality, we'll just call it that. Sometimes it was very precise, as one sees in Ronchon, where the walls are almost neutral middle ground between the things, the religious things with which you identify, the font, the altar, the balcony, and the structure of light. In something like um, La Tourette, where the, the difference is much more radical, 
you, the, the space is effectively being made by fragments of light. And it seems that his famous epiphany by um, La Pelisse on the Brittany shore, where um, you have these rocks, as he calls them, like men here, standing at the edge of the sea with a horizon in the background. He sees it as a coincidence, another coincidence oppositorum, as both dissipating as his kind of wandering world and as constitutive as the place of all measure, as he calls it in the lecture that he gave in Precision in, in, in South America. Um, that is to say, he's in precisely interested in these conditions that seem to be both dissipating and constituting with the uh, character of um, geometry, the precision of geometry. And in many, many ways, the image that Fernando showed of Rio replicates the, the kind of two horizons of the sea, the one that's, you know, the meeting of land and sky vertically, and the other, this meandering world in the foreground um, that is part of the, uh, the elaborate structure of this kind of idea. Um, right, if with, those, with that as a, as a kind of general background condition, I would like to offer the idea that the museum really gives the heart of this, i.e. precisely the examples, even though they pertain to his most important political and sacred spaces, the heart of this lies in the museum, and that that is as a stance by which he can relate to cultural complexity. The last of these is the most vivid of, an, of, a, of a phenomenon that I'll just trace very quickly back. Um, that is to say, the Phillips Pavilion of 57, um, again, one of his tent hills, um, where the interior was a cascade of black and white projections that were colored with a whole a different set of projectors that were colored and to sound by Varese. Um, and this is how he, how he publishes it. Now this cascade of images you can trace back to the Pavillon de Ton Nouveau and where the Rhin Musée de Paris on the left and the great space of decision, the lecture theater in the middle on the right. And this image on the left is taken from L'Aménac d'Architecture Moderne, which is the little thing he published for the uh, uh, Pavillon d'Esprit Nouveau of 25, where you get the whole image filled, you know, yes, you can go on with the geometry, filled with this uh, black cabinet, which is that one right there. You can see it looking back at this painting, and why it's there I don't have time to go into. The caption is about, ostensibly about using crucibles for plants and saying that they're as much part of art as the rest and all of that argument, possibly also something to do with his geometric plants. But what it also alerts you to is the degree to which that whole cabinet and niche structure of his buildings is rooted in this museum motif. And that you can trace back even to the, what I think is the first of these, I'm probably wrong, but um, in the Ozofon house where you have the, you know, the windowless room in the center of the first floor that's called museum and certainly the whole thematic of the studio that develops out of a dark room to the um, painting studio is part of that general thematic. Um, certainly if the Tower of Shadows shares something with this building. We're, we're moving in the direction of a kind of paradigmatic sort of setting. And when it was the Mundaneum, it was of course meant to, a bit like the Phillips Pavilion, review all of culture. It had this curious structure whereby because the Paleolithic people didn't produce much, they'd be at the top and modern culture would be at the bottom apparently stopping at 1929. We produce a lot, so there's a kind of, you might see it as a kind of rubbish pile, but um, the, of culture, but the, sorry, I've lost track of what's the point. But you see there's a triple, there's a triple structure of corridor that is places, objects, and times. The light came in through these. This was an 80 meter high interior cave with a little sort of sanctuary for paradigmatic figures of culture. And this thing is as high off the ground as this is off the surface of Lac Le Main. And that, in, you know, I, I expect you know, particularly given things like that, that he was looking at those, you know, the cenotaph for Boule and this business of the communication with the earth as a way of holding the instability of the cultural material with which he's, with which he's dealing. Lastly, the, um, I, I, I should also say that the Tower of Shadows has reduced all this Wagnerian delirium to, you know, a kind of species of solar primitive hut. 
um, where the same conditions pertain, but they are oriented to what he deemed the fundamental conditions. Lastly, the nature of the ground in which um, the Tower of Shadows is set, this articulated ground of hills and um, trenches and cuts and so forth. This is a characteristic setting that he uses for his um, didactic uh, projects, uh, the Mundaneum, the university that we saw this morning. And you see it first probably in the, um, the early publication of the Spiral Museum, where of course you proceed south to, you, you, sorry, you proceed south going through one wall then another and come up in the inside of the building and all the little creative uh, receptacles, these ateliers, the museum, and these exhibition boxes are all up on POT as part of the family of elevated caves that Tim Benton has pointed out in the houses. And um, we don't have time to go through it, but there's an interesting odd-even game where these things measure the, the kind of rhythm of this ground, um, an odd-even game between wiggly paths and straight paths uh, helping to set up what will be the eventual growth. But it's this articulated ground that um, brings the earth into the composition. It brings the fundamental conditions into the composition, makes it available to being worked with as part of the only place that the order is ordering, if you like. Um, <clears throat> and the degree to which this is an aperçu that you know, pertains to, gosh, mis, trani, um, you first see it in its clearest form in Adelphopia. And it's that which can stabilize the, the voracious referential world of space. You end up with this direct appeal to the earth. On which basis I would argue that tectonics is not an end but a means to this dilemma. Um, and I'll leave that at that because I've talked about that elsewhere. Okay. Um, you can see this, this game of, the, this, is, this is all quite familiar stuff, but as you uncoil from the toilet across the, the bath, the kind of solar diagram as reclining position to what would have been a bed in a niche, to the dropped sill which brings the edge of the land up, this, this kind of negotiation of horizons as part of the domestic setting framed, the, 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 these are cabinets again with, that are tiled on the inside, is part of the same sort of thinking that produces the famous garden in front of um, the governor's palace. Um, we saw another example of it from um, Bogota. I mean, it goes on and on and on. This game of bringing the horizon into the house. And I think the house is a victim of the horizon rather than the other way around. I don't think it's about domesticity so much as he's concerned to keep this thematics in play in the end, it makes the house do too much. You don't need the city. The house is a full sort of synthesis of meaning. Um, now, that's if you're concentrating on the iconography. Um, in fact, the iconography is quite laconic in his buildings. And you don't know whether this kind of comparison, this is obviously my horrible drawing on the left, where I've just done to his building what he usually did with plates and so forth. Um, you know. Is, is, is this inadvertent because that's the kind of forms he's working with or is there an explicit attempt to link it to the Toro, this sort of, um, I mean, for, to cut a long story short, vision of creativity um, that, that is the, the Toro configuration? Um, and even if it is, what can you then say about the mill owners? Or d are you dealing with a more general kind of condition where another one of his cave tent spaces you're, you're in a world where the, the kind of agonic situation is what is really important and is open to um, local interpretation as the, as the situation requires. Now to open this, um, to give you a sense, I mean everybody is very quick to put the paintings and the architecture together. He himself is very assiduous about keeping them apart. Um, I won't go into the details of this, but roughly the paintings are contemplative, whereas the house is, or the architecture is something that you live in. Now in this, but, and I just want to indicate a, 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 another level of difference in how the communication, just a hint at how the communication does begin to take place. Very quickly, we're dealing with a table in front of a window, and you can see how the lower end of the window roughly coincides with the niveau of liquids and so forth in the foreground. 
And if, roughly speaking, there's a kind of Dionysian world coming up from the lower left, there's a kind of Apollonian world coming out of the window and the top, going through the violin, which is divided into the basis of division that produces harmony. And it meets in this curious area in here, where what started out as a bottle top ends up looking vaguely like a ship, like clouds. And that kind of metamorphic world is pretty much the center of gravity of the later drawings. But if we, if we look at this thing, which is obviously the kitchen in uh, Savoie, he, the caption is one of his typical Corbusian statements. He says, it's not quite a sanctuary. Well, you say to yourself, no kidding, Corb, it's a kitchen. And then he goes on to say, the kitchen and the salon are the two places where one lives. And if you look at the, if you look at the planning of Savoie, the kitchen and salon are cut off from the sleeping area um, by a sort of tranche of space that cuts across the whole building, opening from a, um, a little balcony that faces the east behind the photographer here and going to the other end of the building. Um, and you bridge across that when you come up the ramp to go to the strange window open to the north. Um, but if, um, on, he's done things like paint the ground so that it comes up to the top of this bouillot and continues across at this sill. In fact, this table starts in the salon on top of the fireplace, travels along the whole of that facade hitting two sinks, and then comes out into the kitchen. In the foreground, you get fire and water again, and it does seem like rather primitive cookware for a modern villa, but at any rate, um, the, these sorts of objects are distributed in these cabinet-like museums where they play funny little tricks like fold across that opening and you get a little play of coffee and water and mm -hmm. these pots that begin to develop a thematic that's much less sort of dealing with harmony but is, is, is as it were built into the way you you kind of live in these in these rooms. This, this image seems to have been studied quite carefully and insofar as it is a sanctuary one's in, invited to sort of look at it further. I mean the alignment of this ominous door with this piece of bread um, the piece of bread paired with the coffee pot where the piece of bread is dry white grains mixed with fire and water to go produce something white and the coffee is black grains mixed with water and fire to produce something black but also the basics of life versus this curious you know given the argument of um, uh, l'architecture uh, the artecoratif that is almost like food and culture or something of this kind in any case there's this chaos of sticks down here that potentially have a numerology that is obviously a bit like the piloti of the house that when you get up here you see he's taken this window and opened it just enough to make a square and that in fact makes a right angle so there's a kind of movement vertically that um, is a bit like the way the house works south north and you, you see this played again up on, the, up on the roof now people like Cullen Rowe leap immediately to the Eucharist I'm less inclined to do that, um, but we're certainly in the domain of the secular sacred. I mean, there's, there's a, an, an, an odd little problem here. I mean, the cutting of the bread sitting, I mean, usually his chairs are quite prominent. They're little metaphors for dwelling. And the emasculation of the chair and the cutting of the bread seem to me to be much more related to the themes that um, we, were, we were seeing earlier about uh, you know, there's a kind of the, the, the room is a mixture of an atelier, um, a kitchen, and a laboratory, and themes of creativity, primitive and modern, and sacrifice. And what quite what he means by death, metaphoric and actual, is obviously uh, a theme one could spend the rest of the day on. But it's it's with these photographs which sit between the actual buildings and the paintings. It's, it's as if they set themes in motion. It's as if they are t coming out of their 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 center of gravity is actually in the way one lives, as, as he puts it. Now, if one, what the big uh, dimension of communication between the paintings and the architecture is this room. Um, and this, this, this room is where his meanings come to fruition or stability or where they begin to act on each other. And you can see in his text that he's constantly working paradoxes. He just simply declares, for example, under the, under the Parthenon, this is the work of the sculptor, this did not, a, this did not de demand the work of the sculptor. On the door to the Pavillon de Temple Nouveau, the city is a problem of rigorous science, the city is a problem of poetics. He does that over and over and over again. Um, 
And I think he's more concerned with putting the, the issues in play than he is of coming down on one side or the other. But insofar as even that play is an interesting problem, I, you can see how the, the, the thing moves from the ground to praxis to a, 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 um, a kind of world of meanings where it begins to look more like iconography or th and, they, and they prevail in contemplation fundamentally or the, the usual transaction of contemplation and experience. Um, here the thing divides between something like the poem which really does look like what he called an algebra of signs and architecture. This is ultimately rooted in the problem of the secular sacred and really how much sacred can you talk about in the secular and the kind of remark that Schlegel made already at the end of the 18th century you know, the temples still command respect but even after the gods have been re declared ridiculous. Is there such a thing as a non-institutional religion? You know, this is, this is a problem bigger than Korb. People like Iliada concoct terms like Axis Mundi, which are meant to pertain to all peoples. And his books are, you know, full of interesting, but it's like a museum where it's all brought to the same level of signification. We've had, it's a problem that you see first in early romanticism, and it's a problem we've had 200 years of practice at being very clever and never quite grasping the problem. But I would argue that, um, sorry, that's the kitchen in the mill owner's building, um, that even if his, uh, if, 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 whatever you think of his thematic interests, they certainly help him to apprehend the mediation between the human and the uni and uni universal conditions but he was also right to keep silent about them, which for the most part he did. He's much more profound as an architect than he is as a Gnostic theologian. Thank you. Of Le Corbusier's architecture metaphors, the best known is surely that which likened a house to a machine, but he made many others. His early houses at Le Chaux de Fon alluded directly to the fir trees that grew beside them, and his Salvation Army building, particularly its upper story as it meets the sky, assumes the profile of an ocean liner. In studies for Rio, Montevideo, Sao Paulo, in Algiers, his buildings are like bridges to be driven over, and in both visual and verbal writings, Le Corbusier variously likened his elephantine unité de habitation at Marseille to an ocean liner, a filing cabinet, and a wine rack. A dialectician, the greatest, Le Corbusier thought in terms of simile, and in the late 40s, when the devastation of war and the threat of nuclear destruction rendered technology a suspect platform for the promotion of modern architecture, these similes began to take on an archaic and subtly surreal character. Once vehement about the virtues of precision and mathematical certainty, Le Corbusier began more and more to ally architecture with art. His own paintings served as a source for inspiration and innovation in his buildings, and in the mid-30s his paintings had reached a turning point as he began to explore a theme of metamorphosis in a quite literal manner. After the war, Le Corbusier extended this exploration in his architecture. Like certain surrealists, he began to conceive of, or at least to portray, both natural and man-made environments anthropomorphically. Through carefully contrived images, he brought buildings and landscapes to life by paralleling both with the human body. In so doing, he imbued his architecture with a dimension of spirituality and otherworldliness veiling it in an aura that had been all but extinguished in the mechanical age. Buildings metamorphosed into bodies infused with the natural environment. 
These living works transcended style and internationalism to exist simultaneously in ancient, present, and future time, and in the mythological space of the open cosmos. Did we not notice this? Perhaps we sensed it in his buildings, read it in Le Corbusier's presentation of this work, but read it without knowing it. For how in the mid-20th century to cloak a building in cult without rendering it as kitsch? How to allow the curious, polysensuous, and irrational to be born of the logical, the material, the functional, the structural? If these were the questions that confronted the artist Le Corbusier as he moved to coalesce art and architecture, the answer for him lay largely in a single truth, the truth of illusion. For Le Corbusier, visual ambiguity accessed this truth. Cultivated for more than four decades in his many paintings, buildings, and book illustrations, ambiguity provided the means for Le Corbusier to link the real with the ideal, the mundane with the profound. It served him as simile serves the poet. It was a discreet, covert manner of communication. And yet it was the very essence of his art. Ambiguity allowed the figurative to be always present, yet at the same time hidden, accessible only to a privileged few, to those who could see what others could not. The pictorial image of dialectics, it could portray the world as coded, as laden with meaning. In Le Corbusier's hands, it made the present numinous. Let us begin then with a subtle but climactic moment found in Le Livre du Rochamp, the second of Le Corbusier's three books which serve as addenda, as coloration to his famous pilgrimage chapel. Le Livre du Rochamp records a special day in the life of the chapel, the day of its dedication. In so doing, it envelopes the building in narrative not customary to modern architecture. Its records are photographs arranged in a film-like sequence. In image after image, the chapel is presented to us as we might have experienced it that day had we climbed the hill with other worshipers, ambled about the strange structure, took note of its most striking features, and ultimately penetrated its dark interior to be bathed in a special light. When at the conclusion of this sequence, we are returned outside at the chapel's exterior east altar, we witness a ceremony underway the formal dedication of this sacred structure. Then the day is done, darkness falls, and Le Corbusier ends his story with a curious photograph of the chapel at night. The photograph depicts a group of worshipers gathered about a blazing fire just below the chapel's east facade. The figures around the fire appear as fragments, some rendered in silhouette, others as faces and hands suspended in midair and aglow in the dark. The chapel, too, is footlighted by fire, its whiteness emerging mysteriously from the blackness that surrounds it. It, too, is fragmented, and as we gaze intently at it, a sense of the uncanny takes hold. For firelight has transformed the chapel's facade to a glowing, benevolent face, a face that floats in the darkness of the night. Curved balcony is nose, linear bench is mouth, the glass lozenge is right eye, the countenance is nearly complete, complemented with a full head of hair. Shadows cast by the fire from below reinforce this physiognomy and bring to it a distinct personality by adding a bridge over the nose, a triangular lash above the eye, and a hairline where the wall meets roof. The apparition is almost comic, and we might imagine it to move should the flame that animates it begin to flicker. But what to do with such an appearance? Fire to air, air to apparition. Its makeup is like so much myth we know. The genie of Aladdin's lamp, Christian belief which equates the church, Ecclesia, with Notre Dame herself. The new spirit that resides in the body the day of its christening. With its capacity for revealing the secret character of persons and things, photography might recall all of this. And yet there is something comic about this specter that belies any serious attempt to find allegory within its structure. If here we find a face at all, perhaps it should be accepted as little more than that, a finding which Le Corbusier too found, and in which he saw an opportunity for a visual pun, entertaining yet hardly intended to be edifying. But even a cursory review of Le Corbusier's writings on Ronchamp offers much evidence to the contrary, evidence that suggests that Le Corbusier master of ambiguity, may have consciously designed the chapel facade as a face. 
for certainly a face is present in all the Marquettes and study sketches, even in the earliest conceptual sketch, which in addition to its Mona Lisa smile has a definitive head of hair, complete with a stylish curly lock. This earliest face finds an ancestor in Le Corbusier's 1935 painting, Woman, Rope, and Boat, at an open door, where a skull-capped feminine figure with truly strange anatomy stares out at us with right eye only, covering the left with her hand in a last judgment gesture. Indeed, the one-eyedness of the east facade is both its most disturbing and most distinguishing feature, one that can only retard easy acceptance of any suggestion of physiognomy. Yet many of Le Corbusier's paintings are populated with monocular female faces, usually hooded or hard-haired. He sketched himself and his mother in such a manner and in sculpture from the early 50s, work done concurrently with the refining of the design of Ronchamp, he gave monocular face three-dimensional form. Even in celestial bodies, Le Corbusier discovered a one-eyed woman recording in his sketchbook a monocular moon he spied in India in November 1955, a finding he presumably regarded as significant to Ronchamp, for the sketch he drew was later transcribed to a stained glass window of the chapel and subsequently represented in photographs and drawings in his first book on the building. And here one must note that the one-eyed face is hardly exclusive to Le Corbusier but a staple of modern art, presumably because it allows both front and profile views to be presented simultaneously. Picasso used it as such, as did Brancusi, Arp, Apollinaire, Redon, and many others. And when even a cursive check is run, not so distant one-eyed relatives begin to appear in compositions that directly parallel the Ronchamp night scene. Both Clay and Kandinsky did paintings of a very similar kind, and the surrealist photographer Brassai, in a 1936 photo essay for Minotaur, populated the Parisian night with one-eyed figures similar in subtlety to that created by Le Corbusier. Amadea Ozenfant, Le Corbusier's partner in purism, whose journal Le Lone from the teens is replete with one-eyed women, closed his renowned foundations of modern art with an aerial view of the pyramids, which anticipated by 30 years the Ronchamp countenance. Of particular importance is the bipartite composition of the Ronchamp night scene. It's clearly divided into two realms, the upper part where the glowing face floats and the lower part where dark figures are gathered about the fire. Light and dark, sky and earth, heaven and hell, ideal and real, much can be assigned to such duality. In fact, many of Le Corbusier's compositions, including photographs of his own architecture, assume this bipartite division, presumably because regulating lines order them, but also no doubt because presentation in pairs the creation of distinct and adjacent spatial realms encourages dialectical thinking about even the most prosaic of subjects. This disposition is particularly evident in the numerous lithographs which illustrate Le Corbusier's enigmatic poem to a right angle, completed the same year as Ronchamp. In each, an enormous bizarre phenomenon floats in the upper half of the picture. At this time, too, Le Corbusier did drawings, collages, and photographic projections that assume the same parti. In the upper half, colossal body parts appear suspended in midair above a horizon line, while in the lower half, we occasionally find an assembly of onlookers. These parallel images encourage further interpretation of Ronchamp's night scene for they present us with not simply a two-dimensional fleeting phenomenon, but with a kind of giantism. This is to say that once the idea of the chapel with a face becomes somewhat credible, another thought takes hold. If the facade is a face, it follows that the chapel itself is a head, an enormous head that sits atop the hill looking out towards the east. We can inhabit this head, dwell in its darkness, feel the light which penetrates it day after day, year after year, but from within we cannot see out. 
Ronchamp, a head, a cranium, a colossal skull that we the curious, we the worshippers, climb on, probe, penetrate, inhabit. The notion is fantastic and absurd, but again, there is much that might encourage us to consider this strange proposition more closely. In, Paris, in the Paris archive that Le Corbusier took care to establish in his large collection of picture postcards is an image of a modest stone building amid rubble and ruin, the Roman chapel of Notre Dame de Belvedere. The facade is curious. It too exhibits facial features, a mouth and two eyes, the right one considerably smaller than the left, and so perhaps winking are the first clues. With a hairline of projected beams and an ear-like opening on its side elevation, the building is a compact cubic head. On the back of the card, Le Corbusier's inscription designates this tiny Roman chapel, quote, the birth of architecture. Architecture is not built but born. It lives some 40 years later. Le Corbusier interpreted his own creation similarly. On the cover of the small book, Ronchamp, he wrote that his chapel, raised from the rubble of a bomb church on a hilltop in eastern France, quote, is born for today and for tomorrow. He dubbed it the daughter of the spirit, of which one knows neither from where it came nor where it goes. And by so doing, he emphasized its transcendent and phenomenal nature and underscored its fleeting yet persistent appearance. Later, he gave a detailed account of the conception of Ronchamp telling how after having received the commission, he carried the idea of the chapel in his head for several months. During this time, he permitted himself to make no sketches. The human head, he wrote, is made in such a way as to possess a certain independence. It is a bottle into which one might place the elements of the problem, allowing them to float, to brew, to ferment. Then one day, a spontaneous initiative of the inner being one takes a crayon and scratches on the paper. The idea exits. The infant exits. It comes into the world. It is born. The human head is a box in which elements float, brew, and ferment. The description fits equally well a certain building type, which Le Corbusier often proposed, the box of miracles. Though this box was never built, the pavilion Le Corbusier built for the Phillips Corporation at Brussels Fair in 1958 adopted aspects of its program. Corbusier described the building not as a box, but as, quote, an electronic poem contained in a bottle, a stomach assimilating 500 listener spectators and evacuating them automatically at the end of each performance, end quote. Thus evoking flotation and fermentation while encouraging the notion of the building as body fragment. In the darkness of its amorphic interior, visual and sonorous images appeared miraculously. An exclusively phenomenal architecture arose, composed only of light and sound emitted in space. This environment was durational, the architectural analog of 10 minutes of the human mind. At Brussels, Le Corbusier placed the viewer inside the human head. Shortly before the design of this electronic poem, Le Corbusier published another poem, the aforementioned poem to a right angle, Composed of original writings and drawings, the poem to a right angle is a curious hybrid of verbal and visual text in which the cursive handwritten verbal takes on visual form comparable to that of the line drawings which seem to flow from the same pen. Its 20 color lithographs are designed to be assembled side by side to form a right angle tree, a cross which echoes medieval religious narrative art. The drawings often depict minotaur-like creatures woman bull or a winged and horned beast metamorphosed from a human hand. Mirror imaged figures, one black, one white, or one male, one female, are fused into unity. In both form and content, the portfolio which transforms itself into a cross illustrates metamorphosis. It offers for consideration nothing less than a new world view. In Poem to a Right Angle, Le Corbusier placed his own creative energies in a cosmic context which transcends specific time and place. In its most revealing anecdote, he tells how he collected from the road a piece of dead wood and a pebble and how an ox passed all day before his window. 
Quote, because I drew it and redrew it, he explained in the poem, the ox, pebble, and root became a bull. Representation encouraged metamorphosis. The mythic world that emerges from this metamorphosis is evident in the previously noted images of mirage-like visions, strange figures hovering above the horizon line, as if the artists were depicting a seascape in which cloud formations were contorted into signs to be deciphered by the reader. The open hand is one of these mirage-like compositions, a colossal body fragment which in a color lithograph seems to float on a blue sea. Le Corbusier proposed this hand as a centerpiece for his capital complex at Chandigarh, initially sketching it with several figures standing on its thumb, thus rendering it as a colossal body part the size of a building. Built as a rather large sculpture many years after Le Corbusier's death, the open hand monument easily falls within the acceptable limits of modern architecture, which under Le Corbusier's direction actively sought the synthesis of the art. And seen as sculpture, it continued a long line of accents and centerpieces in modern architecture. But seen as originally proposed, that is to say, as architecture metamorphosed in the shape of a human hand, skewered on a steel rod, and left to wave in the breeze, seen as such, the open hand must be understood as yet another affront to the canons of modern architecture. Oops. A colossal head, a giant hand, a stomach or mind large enough to accommodate 500. If such clearly representational, overtly symbolic, and emotionally charged notions find no place within the context of modern architecture, to what realm do they belong? The cora habite, the body to live in, though antithetical to the logic of modernism, falls easily within the sphere of French avant-garde art. For European surrealists in the 1920s and 30s, Figurative colossality was a common strategy for enlarging art into habitable environments. Almost always it was a fragment of the human corpus itself that was enlarged, typically the head, but sometimes the hand, the mouth, the genitals, the intestines. Man Ray, Andre Masson, and even Corbusier's revered Picasso paired both man-made and natural environments with the human body, a fusion that resulted in critical metamorphosis, simultaneously poetic and psychologically probing. Such a fusion would have been attractive to Le Corbusier, who, after all, had been trained in a Swiss Art Nouveau architecture that relied on nature as metaphor for buildings, and who, after having entered the Parisian art world in 1918 as a painter, had persistently aggrandized art into environments with pavilions such as the Esprit Nouveau, Nestle's, and Tomp Nouveau. The absurd idea of buildings as body parts outlined above grew directly from this alignment of architecture with art, albeit with an art whose values differed greatly from those normally associated with Le Corbusier's purism. A brief history of Le Corbusier's engagement with such ideas must suffice to suggest a theory behind such manifestations, a way of thinking about building arrived at not overnight but cultivated over many years. We begin not at the beginning, but in the 1920s when representation itself encouraged speculation about the colossal. At that time, photographs and montages served to fragment the human body into discrete parts. Carefully conceived ambiguity presented these parts as enormous. This is most obvious in the work of Man Ray. In his 1922 portrait of Jacques Rigaud, for instance, The portrait shows Rigaud's head upside down, isolated by focus, and confronted with a tiny wooden poupe, the mere presence of which questions the scale of the head itself. Imaginary projects for bodybuildings followed. In a 1936 self-portrait, for example, Man Ray graphically translated his own head into architecture by sporting six-pane windows as eyeglasses. And in his portrait of the Marquis de Sade, he described the high priest of surrealism as a stone colossal comparable to the great sphinx. In his Le Tour de Lyon, a fortress becomes female. 
as towers and thighs coincide and the building and body share a common entrance. In La Plage, this animation was extended to the scale of landscape as a natural land formation becomes a colossal reclining nude. Salvador Dali provided numerous more humorous variations on this theme, but it's the far more ominous images of Andre Masson that invoke the inherent power of the colossalized human corpus's architecture. Evident as early as 1925, the head as a site for human habitation was a persistent theme in Masson's work, blossoming in the late 30s and early 40s with City of the Skull on the left-hand side and Portrait of Andre Breton. In Masson's project, the body is depicted as an immense carcass without consciousness. The head is a helmet, and to inhabit it is for the viewer to assume the place and presumably the role of consciousness itself. In such works, the psyche is given palpable presence, and a dialectic is established between body and being. A peculiar spatial realm is manifested. Colossal heads invert conventional scale, making the human experience Lilliputian, and underscoring the relativity of the human perspective. Unreal scale does not replace, but rather is placed next to human scale, creating a condition in which two apparently contradictory and mutually exclusive spatial realms exist side by side. Needless to say, these surreal paper projects were seldom realized, and when they were, as with the work of the artist architect Friedrich Kiesler, they remained within the frame of the museum or theater, that is, as stage sets or exhibition sites and environments dedicated exclusively to fiction and fantasy. If such art projects suggest an elusive colossality, a giantism of a similar, though less intentionally surreal sort, was evident throughout Europe and America in the 1920s and 30s, where a new sense of the immense was present in the era's huge new construction. Complementing this scale were various large-scale advertisements rendered in anthropomorphic and mechanomorphic form. Children of popular culture and particularly of the international expositions, these giants were intended for commercial and amusement purposes rather than for intellectual or artistic edification. In addition to these advertisements and engineering feats, the earth itself was a site for work on an unprecedented scale. In Tennessee, the Tennessee Valley Authority built an extensive network of dams to harness the forces of nature, while in South Dakota, at the scale of giants, Gutson Berglum massaged a mountainside into the face of four American presidents, creating the perfect stage set for Hitchcock's finale in the 1957 film North by Northwest. Both projects, each in its own way, contorted nature into a sign, imbuing it with a mythic dimension both awesome and surreal. If both avant-garde and pop culture had thus conceived of a new giantism in which the body of man was enlarged to the size of buildings and landscapes, modern movement architects showed little, if any, interest in this tendency, Le Corbusier being the exception. The movement's principal proponent, in his private files, he nonetheless, labor, he nonetheless harbored images of overtly anthropomorphic colossals. It's not supposed to be there. Oh, okay. Uh, Lestand Ricard on the right hand side. Um, paired volcanoes photographed from above and captioned two breasts. Mount Rushmore under construction on the left hand side with Washington looking a lot like Man Ray's Marquis de Sade. This interest in the anthropomorphic and colossal was not new to Le Corbusier. As early as 1908 and again in 1917 and into the 20s, he had depicted a kind of colossality in his watercolors. And as mentioned before, his purest partner, Ozenfon, frequently featured fictive colossals and drawings published in his journal, L'Alone. When together they co-edited L'Esprit Nouveau, the colossal occasionally emerged in advertisements and in photographic images of monuments and buildings and machines. 
Nowhere is this more evident than in Vers une Architecture, featuring a highly ambiguous and illustrative text that reveals Le Corbusier's pronounced tendency toward physiognomic parti, an inclination similar to that exhibited in the teens by Francis Picabia, Susan Duchamp, Paul Strand, and others. More strangely, though, in the late 20s, in certain photographs of his architecture, Le Corbusier employed wooden poupe in the manner of Man Ray, presumably to suggest a fantastic environment of competing scales. By the mid-30s, this tendency had grown more explicit, and in 1935, in aircraft, Le Corbusier complimented an obviously facial photograph of a fully loaded aircraft carrier with the caption, quote, and Neptune rises from the sea, crowned with strange garlands, the weapons of Mars. This association of ancient myth with the enormous realities of the 20th century would stay with Le Corbusier for decades to come. In the above examples, Le Corbusier employed the inherent illusion of two-dimensional representation to suggest both enormous scale and the aura of the human body and the new industrial landscape that he championed. And in 1938, such suggestions were synthesized into concrete form with his monument to the socialist revolutionary Paul Veillant Cotier. Expressly surreal, it featured a four meter high head placed directly on a shelf, mouth opened wide as if frozen in the act of speech. Hovering above it, an eight meter long hand emerged from a stone slab wall presumably the sign of socialist solidarity. There was about it something both slightly sinister and highly emotive, something that bore little relationship to the rational and positive approach pursued by Le Corbusier in his earlier architecture. Concurrent with this work, Le Corbusier, who had built almost nothing since 1933 and, would had not, and who would not complete a major work until 1946, reintroduced himself as a painter with a major retrospective of his artistic production in Zurich. For this exhibition, he issued a cursive theoretical treatise, ostensibly on painting, but applicable by extension to architecture, in which he stated clearly that he no longer understood painting as, quote, an objectification of the world, end quote. Painting had become for him, quote, an unlimited inquiry, an extremely personal and introspective investigation into the world of appearance which provoked a constant appreciation of the action of the objective on the subjective, the transfer of exterior events into the interior of consciousness. Thus, rather silently, Le Corbusier moved from the absolute and material world of the rationalist to the relative and phenomenal world of the poet-artist and to the new world of the 20th century, the physics of Einstein, the subconscious mind of Freud, the dialectic signification of a Breton or a Loris or even Picasso, all would be accommodated in this new perspective. Ultimately, it would lead to the proposal of a new absolute good for architecture, what Le Corbusier called ineffable space, the inexplicable that arose from the careful conjoining of the illusory space of representation, usually large-scale mural painting, with the real space of architecture. Colossality played a central role in that quest. It emphasized the relative nature of human perspective by providing a second perspective, that of the colossal, that questioned the authority of the first. It created a kind of visual contradiction that ruptured the seamless, ubiquitous space of perspective. In this sense, it evoked a palpable space, while at the same time serving as a means to imbue architecture with a sense of meaning and significance that it, it had lost in its quest for purity. With colossality, Le Corbusier shared common ground, not only with the avant-garde artists of the day, but with the great builders of all ages. With it, he could transcend time and offer his architecture to worlds beyond its own. And one might understand the anthropomorphic in Ronchamp in such terms. The ancient Greeks, various 17th century landscape painters, and the surrealist of the 1930s would have seen it as such. So too would have Picasso, the artist Le Corbusier most admired, for in 1929 he painted monument 
woman's head. Its geometry remarkably similar to Le Corbusier's first church design, the 1929 Eglise Tremblay. And in the late 50s and 60s, Picasso created actual colossals, totemic heads, such as a woman with open arms, a 20 feet high concrete ranchamp twin, and the 84 foot high head of a woman that effortlessly animates its oceanfront site. Still, it is not at all certain that Le Corbusier intended the east facade of Ronchamp as a face, or that he imagined his masterpiece a colossal inhabitable head. What is certain is that Le Corbusier was preoccupied with metamorphosis at this time, and that transformation was at the very heart of his creative endeavor. In the ambiguity of representation, he found a means of transforming architectural of transforming architecture, if only momentarily and only in the mind of the reader, into a mythic construct, a means capable of contorting building into sign, and as such, capable of accessing cosmic order. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Uh, we are going to take another brief break, just maybe 10 minutes, if you want to uh, stretch your legs. And uh, I make it that it's uh, 3.15, so if we could come back here at 3.25 to have the uh, last lecture by, uh, by Stan. Thank you.